fire away, yeah? Okay, well, Sonny, Sonny Topping, uh, UFO researcher, and I'm also uh, a specialist in some unique subjects as well in the world of espionage and all that kind of thing. I've been very kindly asked by We Are Change Manchester to just give a little spiel to camera about the stuff that went on. I just need to get a crucial point over, and that is this. From a public relations and media point of view, you, the conspiracy movement, I am not a conspiracy theorist, I'm a UFO researcher. I've got a public relations problem. And this was interestingly highlighted by Paul Joseph Watness in his opening statement uh, to Paul Scobie, who went on the 7-7 conspiracy road trip programme with me. And his opening remark was, ah yes, words to the effect of, I interviewed Tony and he lets aliens control his thoughts. He said that in an interview. Now, Paul, you know, do the research, look at my material, but more crucially, and this is the point I made to John Scobie, is that if the conspiracy movement needs to instigate change, you sound as bad as the commercial media who are trying to make idiots of us all in trying to get the truth across. So that is my crucial point, and not only that, Mr Watson, but your Infowars channel actually oppressed and censored an interview that I gave to you. That's the crucial point I want to make. And now on with the questions about my appearance on 77 Conspiracy Road Trip. Okay, so how so did um, I say the BBC? How did they first get in contact with you? Why do you think they did? And I think also well, it, it, it happened because it was quite bizarre. It actually happened because it was regarding. Uh, I got three emails from three different researchers, and I thought they were after talking with them. I was going to go on the UFO thing because I'm a UFO researcher. I'm well known for that. Uh, but it ended up with me going on the programme, as I thought, to be a CCTV security type contributor to the media programme, discussing all the pitfalls regarding CCTV and 7-7 and the security issues around it. That's what I thought I was going to do. But that didn't quite happen. Something else happened which actually was quite horrifying. And it was a lot more subtler than somebody in the background trying to forcibly change your opinion. It's a lot more subtle than that when they want to coerce someone. So you, are, you would have no idea when you were doing this that you were being, or I was being, coerced and manoeuvred into the position that I was. Okay, because um, the impression we got from watching the finished result was that initially, Skeptical about the official line on 77, yeah. and then you were. Well, your mind was changed. Let's just clarify what I'm skeptical about. The official narrative of 77 will never be correct because multiple media stories, as clarified by Dr. Duff of Sheffield Hallam University and a few others, multiple media sources from across the world quote events at Canary Wharf that happened, and these are serious multiple international media sources as well as national media sources, so there is no way in hell that that narrative can be ever correct in my mind. And to declare it correct is a, is a, um, a shame really to the victims and, and everyone that, that you know were involved in it, it's terrible, absolutely terrible. And the second thing to remember is that during when I was filmed, what the area I actually changed my mind on was could explosives, homemade explosives, cause the same carnage as military bombs. And when I said, you've convinced me mate, he'd actually convinced me that homemade bombs could actually cause the damage. The official narrative, however, what I said on camera, what was edited outside the Houses of Parliament, I made this remark to Andrew Maxwell, which was, I don't believe all the conspiracy theories, uh, but, the, you know, but I do, I've changed my mind on some of the issues, there's some outrageous conspiracy theories on the internet, and the state cannot be trusted. Now that is edited out, and what you will see at the end is me going, all right mate, all right Andrew, great stuff, blah blah. So that, that, that is all the bits that have been edited out. And I should know, because I've been hounded as a UFO researcher by unknown intelligence services within the state, so I should know what, what really goes on there. But more importantly was the, uh, was the horrifying kind of, not horrifying, it's probably an extreme word, was the, the subtle coercion that took place that manoeuvred me into a position of slander and a position of potential frame for libel. And it, that very subtly. Next minute I know, I'm labelled by the Sunday Express as a conspiracy zealot. I, I came on as a contributor to a chubby programme. I, I had no idea, I'm not a conspiracy feminist, you know, so I had no idea this was going to happen. And there's a piece of footage, the argument on the bus, you'll hear me say, shocking, shocking, absolutely shocking. That's on the broadcast. The reason for that is because we've just seen the bereaved. It looks as if the, it's edited in such a way that the argument on the bus looks as if it's happened earlier in events, when in fact we've had this big who are because we've just seen the bereaved, and I'm very upset about that. It was tactless and it was insensitive, and I asked the director not to use it. 
I asked the cameraman not to use it. It was a big argument that happened on the bus. But they used it. I was professionally lied to by them. And they actually used it after saying that they wouldn't use it. And that was the issue that I had. And that is the ongoing investigation by Ofcom and the head of BBC3. That they would use that footage and they said that they wouldn't. And they went ahead and did. So I was deliberately and professionally lied to. And this, you know, this the treatment of, the BBC are in controversy at the moment, the treatment that they did of staff, I can actually have visions of them rolling round on the floor laughing, making me look a fucking idiot. And, and it's not about that. I thought I was going on to be a contributor to a programme about 7-7. It was a farce. I'm frankly disgusted with it. I'm, I just apologise if people have got the wrong impression. But I think, just thank you for, you know, letting me have the reply to camera. That's what went on. I'm awaiting reply from Ofcom regarding the incident on the bus, regarding the argument, which I don't think should have been used, uh, but it was. It was tactless, it was insensitive, um, and I think that's it. That's all I've got to say. So, so the reality is, from you just agreeing that one aspect of their argument was feasible, that homemade explosive could have been used. Yeah. Um, and that would have been successful. So you, from you agreeing with that, they turned it around 180 degrees. But of course they were. To, to, to imply that you're saying 77 wasn't an inside job, yeah, or you have no inclination to think that 77 yeah. was an inside job after that program. Yeah, that's it. And the, the other alarming thing about it is I, I spent an hour outside the cafe being filled. I know what I'm talking about. I spent an hour talking about the issue security, CCTV, but they filmed the most liableest remark. A single sentence was extracted from that hour's footage and filmed. I I find that frankly appalling that broadcasting professionals would put somebody like me in that position. And they did, quite willingly. You know. So do I think 7-7 was a put-up job? Do I think the Labour ministers sat there and were behind it all? No, I don't actually. I don't think that at all. Uh, what I do think is something is not right with the official narrative and never will be. Uh, and that's my you know, belief on it. There's, um, I don't know what your take on it is, but apparently one of the female uh, Took part in the 7-7 yes. conspiracy object, had no knowledge whatsoever of uh, the guns on the 7-7. Due to, due to the... I was told to read up on it. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, we, we assisted her in contributing because she, she didn't have a clue of the facts. Uh, I have to say, um, in fairness to her, uh, she actually apologised to me later on during the filming and said that she'd been very difficult and she, she actually was very apologetic to me about what went on. But the production staff, you would have no indication that that's what they were up to. They were all very nice. The director, I was told by the crew, was a, was a highly professional woman who uh, had got a background and would not allow such things to happen. They let that argument roll for 30 minutes after we'd just seen the bereave. They let it roll. They allowed it to roll. There was no intervention. It was the most unprofessional piece of broadcast television I've ever seen. Um, you know, and as for Leila, as I say, my quarrel is not with her. That, you're right in what you say, there were some areas where we, we helped her, um, but our quarrel is not with her. She apologised, She over a few drinks, We she apologised, and that's it, so there you go. So you've got no inclination that there might have been uh, plants uh, within the people that took plants? I have no inclination, no, I, that's extreme, no. I mean, there's what, there's, for example, there's, there's, there's an extreme theory going around that I I'm not, you know, it just doesn't happen in that way. But you see, in the media, I've learned it's a lot more subtler to coerce someone and make them look stupid. They were very subtle about that, you know, and uh, I would suggest that they were rolling around on the cutting room floor laughing, and it, it became, instead of a hard-hitting factual documentary, which is what I thought we were entering, it became the Let's Make Me Look an Idiot show. And the guy who, um, John, he's a die-hard conspiracy guy. I'm not. I'm just a researcher. I'm a UFO researcher, really. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I've had to go into that area and look at all the information. But it was, it was like a... A little witch hunt going on with the camera is what I felt, and it was very upsetting to see it broadcast, frankly. So, uh, even though you, what would you say their goal was just to make a sort of laughing stock of people who think that these sort of things might yeah, be well, just, scenario, or yeah. do you think there was something genuinely nefarious? Yeah, there was the, the, what I thought was that we had, from a broadcasting point of view, inexperienced production staff who went down the avenue of the Jeremy Kyle, Jerry Springer format mixed with a 7-7 documentary in the backdrop of a London terrorist incident. It couldn't work and it didn't work and it looked absolutely awful. Do, I don't know, I genuinely don't know if there was uh, a nefarious agenda there, but when you look at the broadcast you can't help but think 
there was something terribly wrong. You just cannot help but think that, I can't help but think that looking at the broadcast. I mean, I gave my all to it. We worked our backsides off with it. I was running around trying to find paperwork for the director so that we could all make it work and make a good piece of television. You would think if you were working for the BBC that they would be one of the best broadcasters in the world and they, you know, it would be the highest standard. But what I saw was frankly alarming. Were there any glaring omissions from the end result that you thought, well, that makes a good case for us, as in the, the, the photograph, fabricated photographs taken outside the tube station? The, yeah, the, 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 there was glaring. Uh, yeah, the, the, there was glaring. I mean, there was some glaring omissions. There was some uh, very interesting stuff coming out with from Crispin Black, for example. Um, Crispin Black criticising Labour's foreign policy criticising the actual Blair administration policy that led to the 7-7 incident, completely edited out. But we had the, the we had the bus show, we had, we had me looking stupid everywhere, but all these key facts, that was one of the things that really bugged me, that that was edited out. Uh, Brian Paddock came out with some very outspoken remarks, simply edited out. Um, I can't think off the top of my head of any of any glaring real omissions because it was all, as Rodney Duff said to me from Sheffield Hallam University, it was biased in such a way that the experts were loaded towards one opinion, which was the official narrative only, and that is the opinion we had to accept. It was in that case, it was therefore imbalanced, and they needed to be balanced. If they'd have put on a die-hard conspiracy theorist who thought it, you know, it would have been brilliant. If they'd have put on Conspiracy theorist is the wrong word, really, isn't it? Because what you're talking about is people who dare to critically think, is what we're really talking about, isn't it? And you've labelled us. You've got a public relations problem, you've got a media problem, because the public don't trust you, major broadcasters won't approach you, you as the truth movement have a major media problem. You're not trusted. Um, and I don't know how you're going to get around it, but, you know, you, for example, one of the things you do is label people, the public as sheeple. How the hell is that going to work with it if you're going to awaken the public? You've got a public relations problem. Um, and I, for me, I felt that I was a, I just don't know, I felt I was a nice guy. Everybody who knows me said, Tony, you were a nice guy, and that is what it was you were taken advantage of. You should have been a bit more solid in what you really thought. And I've learned that lesson, you know, I've, I've definitely learned from that. Right, so uh, final piece of advice for people thinking about taking part in programmes in the future with the BBC or any major media outlet. Yeah, well, I think, well, I think the final piece of advice is do not trust the researcher or the director or anything to tell you. And that they've brought that on themselves because the BBC should be striving for, and other broadcasters for balanced programming. And that's not happening because they seem to be on this path of making people look stupid. And it's appalling. I had a woman up, I had to apologise to a woman in my local post office for the embarrassment that the programme was. Never again with the BBC. They've done the damage this time.